Hi, I'm Tom Long. I have a question for you. Have you ever said the Lord's Prayer? And remember that phrase, hallowed be thy name? What does that actually mean? It's not, it's not like it's a phrase that we would use in everyday conversation. What does it mean to hallow something? In the English dictionary, there's two definitions that are given. One means to make holy or to consecrate something. The second definition is to revere or to honor something. Now, we can't make God's name holy. God's taken care of that. He is holy, so his name is holy. But we can revere and honor that name, and we can live lives in a way that bring reverence and honor to the name of the God that we profess to follow. But let's burrow a little deeper down into that rabbit hole. Um, another word that you just don't use in everyday speech is the word holy. And in fact, we, though we use it a lot in church services, there really isn't, I haven't often heard that word um, defined. Um, not that it can be, you know, fully understood, but uh, the word holy um, actually has a threefold meaning. One is to, to be set apart, to be different. <laughs> the second one is to be exalted, to be lifted up on high. And the third one is to be morally pure. That is, not to have any of the human infirmities, impurities, and sins. God is holy. I wish I could remember when I first heard hallowed be thy name paraphrased as uphold your name as the high and holy one. God hallows his name by acting in ways that are consistent with his holy nature. We hallow God's name not only by revering and honoring God in our hearts, but by living in such a way as to not bring dishonor and shame to God's name, by associating his name with things that have been defiled, like politicians or political causes or uh, just a single nation when God is the Lord of Lords and King of Kings over all the earth, <laughs> not just our little country. So we hallow God's name by not associating it with things that would be anything less than who God is on his throne in heaven. The third of the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, verse 7, says, You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. When we do things that associate God with hate, bigotry, injustice, selfishness, corrupt polit politics, or corrupt politicians, anything that associates God's name with something less than who God is and the pure and loving nature of the kingdom of God, anything less than that is not to hallow his name. When we do these things, we have misused God's name. We have sinned against God. Uh, the, the Bible says the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. So imagine having failed to hallow God's name in some way like that, you suddenly find yourself in the manifest presence of God. Well, that's exactly what happened to the prophet Isaiah some 2,500 years ago. With all of the special effects and CGI and the, the wonders of modern movie technology, we may not be as easily impressed by what it is that Isaiah saw. But imagine this man from 2,500 years ago who had 
never seen anything other than what happens in the natural world. And as we hear this story, we see that he, quote, saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Holy means high and exalted. Check. <laughs> it's very tempting to get distracted in this story by the weirdness of the seraphim in the next verse. Seraphim are described as angels who were fiery and snake-like in appearance. They flew with two wings. They covered their eyes and their feet with the other four wings. <laughs> the seraphim aren't the point of this story, but what the seraphim had to say is very much to the point of this story. They were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. <laughs> they were like a cheerleading squad celebrating the holiness and the glory of God. And they were really building it out because again, quoting the Bible, at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook and the temple was filled with smoke. If you've ever been stopped at a stoplight beside one of those kids that has a huge old honking subwoofer in their vehicle and it's thumping away, then you have a sense of what it was that Isaiah heard in this vision. Now, let's jump back to those earlier thoughts we had about how bad it is to associate the Holy God with anything less than holy people movements and actions to dishonor God's name. Imagine going from that kind of dishonoring life to finding oneself standing in the very presence of God as the angels thunder out about how holy, mighty, and glorious God is. If we can imagine that, we can also imagine saying the same thing that Isaiah said, woe to me and I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty." Unquote. If the story ended here, all we could draw from it is that God is awesome and holy, and boy, do we fall short. But the story goes on. I imagine the transformation was painful because the flaming snake angel takes a burning coal from the altar and touches Isaiah's mouth with it. As Christians living millennia later, we know that the altar is not just where in the Old Testament sacrifices were made for the atonement of sins, but in the New Testament it's where the Jesus offered himself on the altar by dying on the cross for our sins for the sins of the world. So that's where that hot coal comes from. And the angel touches Isaiah's lips with that coal. And he says, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Isaiah was not consumed by the fire, but purified by the fire. And the story continues. Isaiah hears the voice of God saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Now, the word translated in the Hebrew as sin means to send in the same way that countries might send an ambassador or that you might uh, send a, a, a lawyer to plead your case in a, in a hearing. It's sending someone to represent you on a mission. God isn't issuing an order here. Notice he's asking a question, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah famously replied, here am I, send me. Have you ever encountered the presence of God in a way that humbled you, that changed you, that changed the course of your life? If you have, do me a favor and just share a little snippet about what happened in your encounter with God and how it changed your life in our comments below. I'm sure those 
who watched this video would enjoy hearing your story. Now, please join me in this prayer. God who touches our lips and pours over our senses a fresh sense of your divine presence, open in us a readiness to respond to your holy, glorious, awesome presence. Help us to put down our cell phones, our disruptions of life, and the constant list of to-dos long enough to notice your greatness in the beauty of the world around us. May that presence move us and invite us to say, here I am, send me. Amen. Mm -hmm.